Howdy. And so what have we learned? We've learned that Lewis electron dot diagrams enable us to determine if electrons are bonding electrons or non-bonding electrons, but that the Lewis diagrams themselves do not accurately represent the structure. Lewis diagrams are just two-dimensional representations, and so you cannot determine the bond angles from them. We learned that VSCPR theory does enable us to determine the electron geometry, molecular shape, and bond angles of molecules. VSCPR stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion, and the idea is that the regions electron the molecule will take the shape to minimize the repulsion between the regions of electron density. This video is on valence bond theory. Valence bond theory is used to explain how we get the shapes in VSCPR theory that are formed. And so after watching this video, you should be able to describe valence bond theory. You should be able to describe the relationship between the number of regions electron density and the hybridization. Given a molecule, you should be able to determine the hybridization of each atom. And so for VSEPR theory, what we did is we were able to go from the Lewis diagram to the shape, the electron geometry, molecular shape, and the bond angles. And the way we did that was we looked at the center atom, in this case oxygen, and we have one, two, three, four regions. Remember, a region electron density can be a single bond, double bond, triple bond, or their own pair. And so four regions, of course, corresponding to the VSCPR theory, corresponds to a tetrahedral electron geometry with bond angles of about 109.5. Now for the molecular shape, we ignore the, lo the lone pairs, and we see we have something called bent or angular. And so that's how we handled, that's how we used via CPR theory. Now, Venn's bond theory is a little bit different. And the idea is, you know, how do we go from the atomic orbitals, right, S is spherical, P is dumbbell shape, and you have three, three P orbitals per shell, except for the first shell, which has no P orbitals, but they'd be along these, the, these axes. And so how do we go from this shape, these shapes, to our tetrahedral, um, electron geometry that we talked about from VSEPR theory. And so what Venn's bond theory says is that the atomic orbitals are hybridized, changed into hybrid orbitals that explain the tetrahedral electron geometry when you have four regions of electron density. So VSEPR, Venn's shell electron pair repulsion, says the most important factor for the geometry is minimizing the repulsion between the regions electron density. And Venn's bond theory says that atomic orbitals combine to form hybrid orbitals, and that explains the shapes that we see for VCPR theory. Venn's bond theory was developed by Linus Pauling, the only individual to ever win two Nobel Prizes by himself. And Venn's bond theory, like Lewis electron di diagrams and VCPR, are just about the Venn's electrons. Venn's bond theory says Venn's electrons are localized between atoms or lone pairs. And Venn's bond theory says atomic orbitals combine to form these hybrid orbitals. And the half-held atomic orbitals can overlap to form with the hybrid orbitals to form bonds. Hybrid orbitals can also be used to um, contain lone pairs. And so hybrid orbitals are made from atomic orbitals. And the number of atomic orbitals used is equal to the number of hybrid or orbitals formed. Hybrid orbitals are formed by a mixing of the hydrogen-like S, P, and D orbitals that characterize a free atom. The three P orbitals are directed along the X, Y, and Z axes. When we mix an S and a PX orbital, we produce two hybrid orbitals called S, P, pointed in opposite directions along the X axis. Mixing of an S with the PX and PY orbitals produces three equivalent hybrid orbitals in the XY plane. We call these SP2 hybrid orbitals. Notice that the hybrid orbitals have major lobes which contain most of the electron density in the orbital. These are used in bonding to other atoms. Mixing of the S with all three P orbitals results in formation of four equivalent SP3 hybrid orbitals directed toward the apices of a tetrahedron. And so Venn's bond theory says that the atomic orbitals are hybridized to form these hybrid orbitals. And that explains how you get the shape she did in VSEPR theory. Now the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of atomic orbitals used, but also the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of regions of electron density. And so if you have two regions of electron density, VSEPR theory says, well, the electron geometry is linear, the bond angle is 180. 
then the spawn theory says, oh, okay, that's hybridization is SP. That happened because you had two atomic orbitals hybridized to form two hybrid orbitals, which were 180 degrees from each other. If you have three regions of electron density, via CPR theory says that's trigonal planar electron geometry, bond angles of 120. Valence bond theory says, well, that happened because you took an S and two Ps to form three sp2 hybrid orbitals, which are 120 degrees from each other. If you have four regions, via CPR theory says that's tetrahedral, bond angles about 109.5, and Venn's bond theory says, well, okay, that's because you had an S and 3P orbitals forming four sp3 orbitals, um, which were apart from each other, about 109.5. Five regions electron density correspond to trigonal by pyramidal, bond angles of 90, 120, 180. And again, Venn's bond theory would say that's because you had sp3D hybridization. Six would be octahedral, bond angles of 90 and 180, sp3D2. And so the number, the exponent on these is the number of orbitals. And so if you add up those exponents, you actually get the number of regions electron density. So 1 plus 3 plus 2 gives you 6. 1 plus 3 plus 1 gives you 5. 1 plus 3 gives you 4. 1 plus 2 gives you 3. 1 plus 1 gives you 2. But the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of atomic orbitals used. The number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of regions of electron density. And again, for the symbols, sp corresponds to taking an s and a p and forming two hybrid orbitals. sp2 means you took a single s and two p orbitals to form three hybrid orbitals. sp3, you took an s and three p's to form four hybrid orbitals. Again, if there's no subscript shown, then the subscript is a 1. Chemists use valence bond theory and especially the concept of orbital hybridization to answer a fundamental question. How do the shapes of the molecules we observe arise from the orbitals of the isolated ground state atoms that bond? The hybridization concept proposes that in the molecule, the orbitals of the central atom have mixed mathematically and become hybrid atomic orbitals new wave functions with different electron densities and spatial orientations. Let's begin with the simplest case and see how the theory accounts for a molecule with a linear shape. A key point to note is that the number of atomic orbitals that mix always equals the number of hybrid orbitals that form. Here, two different atomic orbitals, one 2s and one 2p, mix mathematically to become two identical sp hybrid orbitals, each with one larger and one smaller lobe. The two orbitals face in opposite directions in the atom. For clarity, we'll show hybrid orbitals in this simplified form. And so what we saw is that you took an S and a P and you could form two SP hybrid orbitals. And so the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of regions of electron density. It's also equal to the number of atomic orbitals used. And so we can look at the atomic orbitals in terms of box diagrams. And so SP hybridization means we take an S and a P, we form two SP hybrid orbitals. Their energy will be an average of the S and the P or orbital energy. And then we're left with two unhybridized P orbitals. First, we'll use box diagrams to depict hybridization and consider the central beryllium atom in the linear molecule BeCl2. The isolated Be atom has filled 2s orbital and three empty 2p orbitals. In the process of hybridization, the 2s and one of the 2p's mix and form two sp hybrid orbitals. The two electrons from the 2s become distributed into the sp orbitals, one electron each with parallel spin. The two other 2p orbitals remain empty and unhybridized. Here is the same process in a box diagram that shows orbital shapes. Putting these ideas together, we can imagine the hybridization process for BeCl2 is something like this. 
the isolated beryllium atom with its filled 2s and empty 2p's is shown with the small box diagram above. The chlorines have three 3p orbitals, but will fade out the ones that are not involved in bonding. In the molecule, beryllium has undergone sp hybridization. The half-filled sp hybrid orbitals overlap the half-filled chlorine orbitals to form two BeCl covalent bonds that are 180 degrees apart. From here on, we'll show electrons within orbit. And so what we see is that we can go from these atomic orbitals to these hybrid orbitals, and that ex can explain the structure of that molecule. And so we took an S and a P, we formed two SP hybrid orbitals, which are 180 degrees. Now, when the SP hybrid orbital overlaps with another orbital, you form a sigma bond. A sigma bond has electron density on the internuclear axis. Now, these P orbitals here are just referred to as unhybridized P orbitals. And so sp hybridization leads to a linear electron geometry. And so the number of regions electron density is equal to the number of hybrid orbitals. And so if you have two regions electron density, via CPR th theory tells us that's um, linear electron geometry. Um, Venn's bond theory tells us that's sp hybridization. And again, it's kind of interesting. The energy of the hybrid orbitals is going to be an average of the energy of the atomic orbitals. So we had one S and one P, and so this energy should be exactly in the middle between the S and the P. And so hybrid orbitals can be used to form sigma bonds, and sigma bonds are where you have density on the internuclear axis. And so the internuclear axis means if we took a line between the beryllium and the chlorine and drew a line that would be the internuclear axis. And so sigma bond, you have density about around the internuclear axis. Um, hybridization, hybrid orbitals can also be used to carry uh, lone pairs of electrons. And so to determine the hybridization of an atom, the first thing you do is Lewis diagram. Remember, many times the first thing you have to do is Lewis diagram, so please get very good at it. And then from the Lewis diagram, you just look at the number of regions electron density, and that would give you the hybridization. And again, the number of regions electron density is just equal to the sum of the exponents. 1 plus 3 plus 2 is 6. 1 plus 3 plus 1 is 5. 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 regions. 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 regions. 1 plus 1 is 2 for 2 regions. <coughs> and so we saw that sp hybridization corresponds to a linear arrangement, bond angles 180. SP2 corresponds to a trigonal planar electron geometry. And so we take an S and two P's. Then the average of that, though, the energy of those three orbitals is equal to the energy of the hybrid orbitals. And now we have three hybrid orbitals which form our trigonal planar. And when you have overlap of the hybrid orbitals with, say, an atomic orbital of fluorine, you have electron density on the internuclear axis, and that corresponds to a sigma bond. Single bonds are typically sigma bonds. If we take an S and 3P orbitals, that gives us sp3 hybrid orbitals. So we took four atomic orbitals, we get four hybrid orbitals, and that corresponds to four regions of electron density. And so again, Van's bond theory is telling us how we can go from these atomic orbitals, spherical and dumbbell shape, to form these hybrid orbitals, which are tetrahedral. Now again, if the hybrid orbital overlaps with the atomic orbital, that forms a sigma bond. And so hybrid orbitals can be used to form six sigma bonds or to carry lone pairs. And sp hybridization corresponds to tetrahedral electron geometry. And so again, you can tell that because a sum of the exponents, 1 plus 3 is 4, corresponds to four regions of electron density, which via CPR tell, theory tells us should be tetrahedral electron geometry. A methane molecule forms when four hydrogen atoms form sigma bonds to the sp3 hybrid orbitals of the carbon atom. And so please remember sigma just means electron density is on the internuclear axis. And so here we have methane, four regions, so that corresponds to sp3 hybridization, tetrahedral electron geometry. Here we have ammonia, again we have four regions electron geometry, 
Um, but one of the regions is a lone pair. A single region electron geometry can be a single bond, double bond, triple bond, or a lone pair. And so for ammonia, we're seeing that a hybrid orbital is used to contain the lone pair. It's, they're also used to form sigma bonds. Here we have water, and so oxygen has two lone pairs. And so we have two hybrid orbitals using to contain those lone pairs. And then we have two hybrid orbitals used to form sigma bonds. So hybrid orbitals can be used to form sigma bonds or contain lone pairs of electrons. If we look at ethane, each carbon is surrounded by four region electron density. So that would be tetrahedral electron geometry, and that would be sp3 hybridization. And so again, if you're asked what is the hybridization of, say, the central atom, the first step is to draw a Lewis diagram. And then all I have to do is count the regions. One, two, three, four. And four regions correspond to sp3. One plus three is four. For boron trifluoride, Remember, there's three exceptions to the octet rule. Boron and aluminum are often happy with six. Um, elements in the third row and lower can have more than eight. And if you have an odd number of electrons, obviously you cannot have noble gas configuration for all the atoms. And so for bond trifluoride, we have three regions around that center atom, and so that would be sp2. Incidentally, the fluorine here has four regions, and so each fluorine would be sp3. And so you can determine hybridizations for all the atoms. OCS, and so the carbon has two regions, that would be sp. The sulfur and the oxygen have three regions, and so that would be sp2. Hydrogen sulfide, the sulfur has four regions. And again, a single region can be a single bond, double bond, triple bond, or a lone pair. And so four regions correspond to sp3. One plus three gives us four. Now you can even determine hybridizations for things that look fairly complex. Again, all it's a matter of counting the region's electron density. You know, here we have three regions around that carbon, and so it must be an sp2 carbon. Here we have four regions around that carbon, and so it must be an sp3 carbon. Um, similarly, when you do bond angles, all you do is count the number of regions, four regions, and so that's tetrahedral electron geometry, so that's bond angles about 109.5. Three regions, trigonal planar electron geometry, and so that should be bond angles about 120. And so, again, I mentioned that there's three ex exceptions to octet rule. Bar and aluminum are happy with just six. Elements in the third row and lower can have more than eight. And if you have an odd number, then you cannot have noble gas configuration for everything. And so sometimes you'll have more than eight vents electrons, again, third row and lower. And so if you have five regions electron density, like in this phosphorus pentachloride, then that will give you sp3d hybridization. One plus three plus one gives us five. Five regions correspond to trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry. If you have six regions, like in the sulfur hex, um, hexafluoride, and so six regions corresponds to octahedral. Um, six, one plus three plus two gives you six. And so Venn's bond theory has enabled us to tell how we can go from these atomic orbitals to these hybrid orbitals. And that's consistent with the VSEPR theory. And so the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of atomic orbitals, which is equal to the number of regions electron density. And so to determine hybridization, it's really pretty straightforward. All you have to do is count the number of regions electron density, and that will tell you the hybridization. The symbols used for the hybrid orbitals just means, you know, like sp3d2 here, means we took an s, three p's, and two d's to form six hybrid orbitals. The sum of the exponents has to equal the number of hybrid orbitals, which is equal to the number of atomic orbitals used, which is equal to the number of regions electron density. And so if we look at ethene, Notice that each carbon has three regions, and so it's going to be sp2 hybridized um, carbon. And so you'll have three hybrid orbitals used to form sigma bonds. But what about the double bonds? Single bonds are typically sigma. What about double bonds? Carbon is most commonly at the center of a tetrahedral grouping of single bonded atoms. But it also occurs at the center of a trigonal planar grouping that includes a double bond. Consider the carbon-carbon double bond in ethylene. Valence bond theory proposes that each carbon undergoes sp2 hybridization. 
It's filled 2s and two half-filled 2ps mixed to become three half-filled sp2 hybrids, and the fourth electron occupies the unhybridized 2p. Let's examine the orbital view and highlight the two ways carbon orbitals overlap to create a double bond. Here, each carbon is undergoing sp2 hybridization. Note how the unhybridized 2p orbitals lie perpendicular to the trigonal plane of sp2 hybrids. The two sp2 orbitals facing each other overlap end to end. The bond they form is called a sigma bond. It is symmetrical along an imaginary line between the nuclei and is not weakened by the rotation of one atom with respect to the other. Now, focus on the two parallel 2p orbitals. By substituting accurate representations of 2p orbitals, you see that they can easily overlap side to side. This results in a pi bond, one that is not symmetrical along the line between the nuclei. Most importantly, it is weakened and, in fact, breaks by rotation of one atom with respect to the other. Thus, a double bond consists of one sigma and one pi bond. In the ethylene molecule, four H atoms overlap the four other carbon sp2 orbitals. And so this part's a little confusing. You know, a single bond is a sigma bond, meaning you have electron density on the internuclear axis. That's pretty straightforward. A double bond is typically a sig sigma bond plus a pi bond. Now, the pi bond is confusing in that half the electron density is above and half the electron density is below. And so remember that electrons have wave and particle-like properties. And so don't think about electron just as a particle, because if it was just a particle, it couldn't go from here to there. It's just that half the electron density is below, half the electron density is above. And so a single bond is typically a sigma bond, a double bond is a sigma and a pi, and a triple bond is a sigma plus a pi plus a pi. And so again, the way of thinking about ethene, we took an S and two P's to form three sp2 hybrid orbitals, and then we have this unhybridized P. And it's going to be the unhybridized P that overlap to form the pi bond. And so here's the three hybrid orbitals used to form the three sigma bonds. Again, sigma just means electron density on the internuclear axis. The sigma bonds in ethylene come from the overlap of sp2 hybrid orbitals, one from each carbon atom. And now the pi bond is overlap of the unhybridized P. And so again, this P just wasn't used in the hybridization, and so we refer to it as an unhybridized P. And so the overlap of the two unhybridized P's on the two carbon give you that pi bond. The pi bonds arise from the overlap of unhybridized P orbitals, one on each carbon. Note that pi bonding electrons are found in a region above and below the sigma bonding region. And so remember, electrons are not, you know, little particles, but have wave-like properties. And that's kind of how you can understand that half the electron density is above and half the electron density is below. It's also important to note that if you try to rotate about this carbon-carbon bond, you would break that pi bond. And so then if you combine the sigma and the pi bonds, this is kind of what it looks like. When we look at both sigma and pi bonds, we see that the CH2 fragments are coplanar and that ethylene is a flat molecule. And so this is a fairly decent calculation. The, the surface corresponds to one value electron density and the color corresponds to electrostatic potential on the surface. And so if you notice on the flat part, it's a little red and that corresponds to those pi electrons having a negative charge, obviously. And then you notice on the hydrogens, it's a little bit um, positive charge. So blue corresponds to positive charge, red corresponds to negative charge. And so again, you cannot rotate about a double bond because easily because you'd break that pi bond. And so you can rotate about a single bond relatively easily. And so at room temperature, um, carbons rotate about single bonds. And so this is butane, everything's a single bond. And notice that this is the energy as a function of angle rotation about that bond. 
And so notice the difference between the most stable and the least stable. The difference is about 60 kilojoules per mole. And so at room temperature, you can rotate about that single bond. Um, the difference in energy corresponds to the repulsion between these hydrogens. And so right now, the hydrogens are far apart from each other. They're opposite sides. And so repulsion is minimum. Remember, the stronger the repulsion, the higher the energy, the less stable. And so the configuration right now is, is relatively stable. That's where that black dot is. But if you move this carbon up, then the hydrogens will be able to interact with each other and you'll have a stronger repulsion and that's going to correspond to that higher energy there. Butane can rotate easily about its carbon-carbon single bond because the atoms of its methyl groups repel each other rather weakly. Rotation about this bond is accompanied by a small energy barrier and occurs readily at room temperature. The two so, sides of the molecule are therefore constantly spinning with respect to each other. So the energy barrier is small enough that you get rotation about that bond at room temperature. Now this uh, molecule, butene, has a double bond right there. Now again, if you rotate about the double bond, you break the pi bond. And so in this orientation, the pi bond is intact. And so that corresponds to that low energy. If you rate, rotate 180 degrees about that angle, then the pi bond will also be intact and that corresponds to that point there. Now, if you rotate about this angle 90 degrees, then you're completely breaking that pi bond and that corresponds to that high energy here. Higher energy, the less stable. And so notice here the difference in energy between least stable and most stable is over 200 kilojoules per mole. Now that's too big for rotation about um, that carbon-carbon bond at room temperature. And so it's kind of interesting. Here you have electrostatic repulsion that causes the difference in energy between the hydrogen. Here you're, you're breaking or forming that double bond which is causing the difference in energy um, as a function of angle of rotation. The carbon-carbon double bond prevents the ends of the two butene molecule from rotating freely relative to each other. As one end rotates, the energy of the molecule increases greatly because the carbon-carbon pi bond must be effectively broken. That is, there is a large energy barrier to rotation around the carbon-carbon double bond. But this movie's probably not completely exact because you know, this orientation should be a little bit lower to energy than when this carbon is up here and you'd have a little bit more repulsion. But the main consideration is you rotate this 90 degrees, you break that pi bond, and you go from a double bond to a single bond. And so a question you could see in the very near future is what's the hybridization of the carbon below? And again, it's pretty straightforward. You just count the regions. So three regions would be sp2, two regions would be sp. And again, we can look at the sigma bonds. So hybrid orbitals can be used for sigma bonds or, or to carry lone pairs. And then we can also look at the double bonds and the double bonds, well, sorry, the pi bonds. The pi bonds are formed from the unhybridized p orbitals. And so single bonds are from sigma bonds. Double bonds are from a sigma and a pi bond. And a triple bond is actually from a sigma plus a pi plus a pi. And so here we have ethylene. And so we have two carbons. And so we have two hybrid orbitals because we have two regions of electron density. And so that leaves us with two unhybridized p orbitals. Now these two unhybridized p orbitals can actually be used to form two pi bonds. And so we can actually get a triple bond between these two carbons because we're gonna have a sigma and then two pi bonds. And so a sigma bond is typically a sigma, a double bond is a sigma plus a pi, a triple bond is a sigma plus a pi plus a pi. Now sometimes these pi electrons can actually be delocalized. And so here we have benzene. And so this would be the line structure. You actually have a hydrogen at each of these corners. And so you have two resonant structures. We can put the pi bonds here, 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 or there, there, and there. Remember for resonant structures, the actual structure is an average of the resonant structure. And so a better way of probably representing the benzene ring is this way. And so here we have the sigma bonds. 
and then you see that the pi bonds are completely delocalized and then you see the pi and the sigma bonds Here's a decent calculation for the benzene. And so the surface is one value of electron density. Again, the color corresponds to the electrostatic potential. And you see the red corresponds to the partial negative charge, the blue partial positive charge. And so you see a red on the face and that corresponds to the pi electrons. And so you can determine the number of sigma bonds and pi bonds in a molecule by thinking about the number of single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. And so for that first one, we have only single bonds, and so those are all sigma bonds, and so we'd have seven sigma bonds and zero pi. Now to draw the Lewis diagram for the next one, we actually have to use a double bond. And so the double bond is a sigma bond and a pi bond. And so that means we have one, two, three, four, five sigma bonds, and then one pi. To draw a stable Lewis diagram for this one, we need to use a triple bond. And so we have one, two, three sigma bonds, and then two pi bonds. And so Vanden's bond theory explains how the different shapes and bond angles of molecules are formed. And so how we can go from the atomic orbitals to the shapes that we talked about in VSEPR theory. I hope that was helpful.